hello. For tonight's grisly tale, I'm going to read you a story from Fearsome Tales for Fiendish Kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Squeam. Tonight's story is called Prince No Man. There were no flowers in this desert where tumbleweed rolled lazily across the parched plains like ghostly tractor wheels, lizards sunbaked in the searing heat, and three drops of water made a man rich. In the middle of this scorching inferno stood a walled town called Misery, and inside its four crumbling sandstone towers a palace in which there lived a king and a queen who went by the name of Volgar. He was old and crumpled like a damp erming cloak that had lain too long in a trunk in the attic, but she was young and beautiful and was possessed of sturdy child-bearing hips, which was just as well, because the antique king needed a son and heir sharpish. The Volgar family had been big in misery for five centuries. For the last three hundred years they had ruled unchallenged, enforcing their will on the people through fear and brutality. But the king was close to death, and the family knew that without an heir to the throne, the Volgar name would disappear from the history books forever, like a short-legged camel in a sandstorm. And so, on the king's 96th birthday, a bride had been chosen for him by his mustachioed sister, the indomitable Princess Flory. A young peasant seamstress called Letitia had been plucked from her parents' home by the Volgar's black-shirted guards and carried screaming and kicking to the palace dungeons. The wedding had taken place that very same day in the palace chapel, and the family had gathered round to bill and coo at the loving couple, the ancient king drooling in his bath chair, and his fresh-faced bride manacled to the altar rail by her wrists and ankles. One year later, on a bright summer morning, as the sky skimmed with vultures and the desert floor cracked like a jigsaw, Queen Letitia gave birth to a baby boy. The Volgars celebrated their family's salvation for seven days and seven nights until the royal wine cellars ran dry and the banqueting halls groaned to the sound of bursting stomachs and trumpeting snores. Never in the history of the whole universe had the birth of a small prince been so keenly awaited by a family of debauched despots. The baby was snatched away from the queen and handed round the court like a parcel. Argumentative aunts, unctuous uncles and chattering cousins loomed up close to the baby, shoving their blackened teeth, their pinched lips, their hooked noses and their thick hairy moles into his frightened face. Oh, isn't he sweet? squeaked Princess Flory. He's got my mouth. Yes, but he's got my dreamy green eyes, spluttered wine-sodden Uncle Igor. And, and his sticky out ears are like mine, twittered Grandma Wilhelmina, pinching them between her cold blue fingers. Her fat sister, Aunt Wildebeest, slapped her hand away. No, they're not, she squawked. They're like mine. Oh, go boil your head, snapped Grandma Wilhelmina. I saw them first. Oh, look, he's got my crooked teeth, roared Cousin Theo. You stupid man, spat Princess Flory. Babies don't have teeth. Well, he's got my pink gums then, sulked Cousin Theo. And my well-born chin, gushed the Marquis of Boot. All in all, he's every bit a vulgar. Um, excuse me, apologised a tiny voice from the far end of the throne room, but doesn't he look like me? It was Queen Letitia. Well, he is my baby, after all. Was, sneered Princess Flory. Was, my little 
peasant girl. He's a vulgar now. And all the while, the king was going gaga in his bath chair. What should we call our son? inquired the queen of her frail husband the next day as she tucked the tartan rug neatly under his knobbly knees. Dell? Uh, he's a prince? croaked the crumbling king, dribbling into his tin bib. He, he needs a name that will inspire men to heroic deeds. A strong name, a bold name, a name like he thought for a moment, sending his roomy eyes into a dreamy spin. A name like mine. Norman, queried the Queen, who liked her husband's name even less than she liked her husband. Norman, coughed the King. Nothing nobler, the Queen protested. But what about Ronnie or Stan or Elvis? Now Elvis, there's a name. Norman! reiterated the king, who would not have his decision challenged. My son shall be called Norman, and there's an end to it. Now, had that been an end to it, this story might never have been told. But three days later, at the official naming ceremony attended by dignitaries from all four corners of the earth, the king, in his dotage, made a tiny slip that was to cast a dark shadow over the prince's life and plunge the Volgar dynasty into terminal decline. The king forgot his reading glasses. Come the auspicious moment when he was called upon to announce the baby's name, he discovered that he had left his spectacles in the soap rack across the bath and was therefore unable to focus on the crib sheet for his speech. Two strapping young courtiers supported him on either arm as he tottered up the aisle to the cathedral pulpit and cleared his throat. The crowds outside awaited the naming of their new prince with bated breath. I, I name my son, declared the king, peering closely at the blurred text in front of him. I name my son. No man. The gas from the vulgar family mushroomed up to the vaulted ceiling like a nuclear blast. Loyal subjects fainted in the streets. No man, exclaimed Queen Letitia. No man, bristled Princess Florrie's furry top lip. Well, that's what it says here, explained the weak-eyed monarch. So no man he shall be. Oh, calamity. For as you all know, a man called No Man very swiftly becomes no man at all. Within a week, to the Volgar's dismay, No Man developed those tell-tale signs of invisibility. No waist with which to hold his trousers up, feetless socks that dangled off his legs like sausage skins with the meat sucked out, and a pale skin that grew paler by the day until one night, when the royal nanny lay him naked on the sofa to change his nappy, she saw straight through him, and no man became a cushion cover. The royal doctor was called to examine no man, but his medical equipment proved useless. Unable to ascertain which way up the invisible prince was, he couldn't even take his temperature, in case he stuck his thermometer in the wrong end. The royal cook was ordered to prepare vats of semolina, no man's favourite food, in the hope that it might put some flesh on him. But the semolina just plopped straight through the prince and made a mess on the floor. Uncle Igor even asked the royal bodybuilder to come and build the prince a new body. But when the royal bodybuilder pointed out that this was not what a bodybuilder did, Princess Flory had his head chopped off. The Volgars were fuming for a see-through prince was no prince at all, and no prince meant no prizes. Their 500-year-old reign of terror looked set for an early bath. It seemed that nobody could prevent Prince No Man from reaching his vanishing point. That didn't stop Queen Letitia from trying, so 
she stole 30 lead slates from the chapel roof and cut an old pink bath towel into the shape of a baby grow. Then she stitched the lead into the suit and popped no man inside, sprinkling him with water from a garden hose before pinning him out on the washing line to dry. The lead line baby grow shrank to a perfect fit and clung to no man's fleshless body like a magic outer skin, rendering every part of him visible again. Every part of him, that is, except his face. For the Queen had adapted a small balaclava to cover no man's head, and as we all know, balaclavas have a hole at the front where the wind gets in. Nonetheless, face or no face, no man's rebulked body was rapturously received by the court and proved most timely because the old King took a sudden turn for the worse during his mid-morning coma and woke up believing he was Florence Nightingale. And as anyone will tell you, a king who is two gems short of a crown is about as much use to his country as a plague of frogs. The royal doctor pronounced him a fruitcake and told the Volgars to find a new monarch. Queen Letitia was summoned to the great oval office of power. Prince No Man will become king tomorrow morning, barked the whiskery Princess Flory. The Volgar family wobbled their fat necks in agreement. But, but but he still has no face, protested Queen Letitia. What will the people of misery think when their new king appears on the balcony with, well, nothing between his ears? Oh, you're right, conceded Princess Flory. Faceless kings are not popular. You'll just have to make him one. Me, blurted the Queen. Make a face? Out of what? I'm not a surgeon. I'm a seamstress. You have until tomorrow morning, said Princess Flory scratching the five o'clock shadow underneath her nose, or I'll have you buried alive in a scorpion's nest. And that, as the people of misery had learned to their cost, was a promise. That night, the palace was as silent as a tomb. A shadowy figure tiptoed through the west wing, flitting in and out of the Volgar's bedrooms like a ghost. Outside, the moon slipped behind a cloud, the desert was black and still, exhausted by the fierce heat of the day. A light blazed out from a tiny window at the top of the palace's golden tower, like a lighthouse in a storm. It came from the Queen's private sewing room. The door opened and Queen Letitia crept in, carrying her bright red pinking shears in one hand and a bulging brown sack in the other. She sat down next to a sewing basket and by the upright flame of a small white candle threaded a length of pink cotton through the eye of a darning needle. Then, whilst all around her slept the sleep of the dead, she rebuilt Prince No Man's face. Grisly peace by grisly peace. The palace bustled back to life at dawn, as it had done every morning for 300 years. Only this particular morning was different. The Volgars refused to come out of their bedrooms until all of the mirrors had been removed from the palace. Up in her sewing room, Queen Letitia had finished her work and she laid her needle down next to her pinking shears. On her lap, Prince No Man lay asleep his tiny mouth fluttering open and closed as he dreamed. By lunchtime a huge crowd had gathered outside the palace, anxious for news of the king. When Queen Letitia appeared on the balcony cradling a small pink bundle in her arms, the crowd fell silent. The king is dead, she announced. Long live Prince No Man! But Prince No Man is invisible! shouted a spectator boldly. He can't be king if nobody can see him! Well, says who? cried Queen Letitia. Look for yourselves! As she raised her son above her head, the gasps were heard as far away as Catman do. He has a face! trilled Molly the Mirage Maker. Isn't he handsome? Such a family resemblance, said the snake butcher's wife. 
He's got Princess Florrie's mouth, God love him. And Uncle Igor's dreamy green eyes, added Pew, the rain collector. His sticky out ears are just like Grandma Wilhelmina's, called the voice of Misery Radio from the back. No, they're not, argued Tom, the camel wash attendant. They look just like Aunt Wildebeest's. For sure, he's got Cousin Theo's pink gums, bellowed Ms Pellet, the goat squeezer. And the Marquis of Boots' well-born chin, added a small scruffy boy at the front tumbling off his bike as the crowd surged forward to hail their new prince. The queen kissed her baby son on his mustachioed top lip. You know, she smiled, they're right, little no man. All in all, you really are every bit a vulgar. From that day to this, Queen Letitia has ruled over misery with compassion and understanding, preparing her beloved son for the day when he is old enough to succeed her as King No Man the First. And the Volgas, what of them? Well, since that moonless night, they have refused to show their faces in public. They have become no men living alone in their shuttered bedrooms, shunning the light and the company of other human beings. If you're still wondering why, I'll tell you a joke that everyone in misery finds funny. My dog Volgar's got no nose. How does he smell? Well, he can't. I just told you. He's got no nose. 